Word on. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Bible study with Sister Denise and Straight Thinking Teaching Ministries. We are in the awesome book of Bamidar. It comes to us in our English language, the book of Numbers. So last week, we were in this uh, chapter 19, which dealt with the cleansing that comes about through the offering of this red cow. And it's unlike our other offerings, which were female, which were male, the red cow is female. And the scripture teaches us that she was offered and her ashes, the, the ritual of the process of this offering equally as detailed as the other sacrificial offerings that were uh, primary and regular and routine that opens the book of Leviticus. This particular offering is reserved and not introduced to us until we get into um, the book of Bamidar or Numbers chapter 19, female and specifically red. Now, we don't have time to go into any more specific details without uh, prolonging our Bible study, our through the Bible Bible study, because that is very, very lengthy. Because then you get into areas such as genetics that control the uh, color um, of the red cow and why the Lord God um, required Israel and why Israel today is looking for that perfect red cow to offer for purification and for cleansing. I urge you to continue to uh, study the scriptures with respect to the red cow and its significance and why the nation of Israel even today is looking for that perfect red cow and is preparing even today for the rebuilding of the third temple. All of that's a huge, huge uh, area of, of study. And so we can only touch on those areas. But what it means for us today as believers who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God, who is Christ Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world, that it is by his blood and the offering of his blood unto the Lord God, the Father, that we are made clean and also by the washing of the water of the word of God and our position in Christ, what that means as believers who are just not mental assenting to a lot of facts, but who are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the word of God, because we have been born again by the word of God and the spirit of God. And it's the word that continually cleanses us together with our confession of our sins daily, that we maintain our cleanliness and our purity. Nothing we do 
in and of itself does that. It is all the work of the Holy Ghost. It's him, our position in Christ. And that's key, being in Christ that does that for us. Christ has done it all. So we are saved by grace through faith in everything what Christ has done and what it means, whether we understand it or not. That's a whole different ball game. And it really doesn't matter whether I understand it or not, because I don't understand all of it. Um, then that would make Christ probably unnecessary if I did, because um, I would get beside myself, because that's just the nature of the human man, mankind. So um, that's what would happen. It, it happens with us now with just a little bit of knowledge that we do have. We get carried away with it, full of pride and become arrogant. And then we claim that we know it all. And then so God doesn't exist. But be that as it may, that's how we may make and maintain our purity in Christ so that he will ultimately present us unto God without spot, without wrinkle, not us. And as we were growing up in our uh, holiness churches, that without spot, without wrinkle, it came across as if that was something that we do. Well, the teaching on the red cow lets us know that is not true. Nothing about our salvation is a direct result of what we do. Yes, we contribute because you have to have a mind to understand things, your spiritual condition, so that when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can make a, an informed and a very wise choice. So it is important that we are given the truth of salvation so that we can make a choice for what God has done in Christ, for Christ, through Christ, and what Christ is going to do in his next phase of the plan of salvation. It does take my mind and your mind to understand spiritual truth, to continue to make choices and decisions that are consistent with having been given the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it means so that we could live by faith, continually trusting in Christ. So that's how we maintain our purity and cleanliness through the knowledge of Christ and increasing in that knowledge of Christ and of God so that our life reflects that we indeed are living by faith, have truly been born again by the word of God and the spirit of God and are trusting in Christ at every step of the way. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture of the red cow and the ashes mixed with water that purifies and sanctifies those who come or came to it as in the past. And it's a beautiful picture of what Christ's work has done for us. Now we are in the book of Bamidar chapter 20, and now we're getting close to uh, the what Josephus, the Jewish historian, in his wars of the Jews, uh, called the, oh, they're preparing to enter into the promised land 
and they are beginning to get into battles and warfare with the surrounding people and the surrounding, uh, these are nation states. So take your mind back to when we were in grade school and we were learning about world history and these different warring factors groups that war against each other. Well, this is what's happening and about to happen. And now increasingly as the nation of Israel and this new generation is preparing to enter into and the conquest of the first group of the descendants of Israel who will occupy the land that is known as the land of Israel and even today. So now we're now going to see the death of the leadership. You have Miriam and then you also have in between Miriam some uh, skirmishes with the distant relatives of the children of Israel. And then you have the death of Aaron and then more skirmishes. And then finally, uh, the great lawgiver, Moses himself, who does not enter in to that promised land. And we're gonna see why he lost out in that regard. And this is gonna come as uh, maybe a surprise to some, but not to others. Some of the things that we have been taught about salvation with respect to uh, saints who sin. And you have some now very powerfully, uh, uh, they preach and, and they, they say that if you sin, you're going to hell. Well, nobody's going to heaven if that's the case. Um, that's just not true. The Bible does, God does not teach that, neither in the Old Testament and neither in the New Testament does God teach that. So Miriam, if that were the case, she should have been cut off when she uh, and her brother conspired with her brother, her brother Aaron to overthrow the ordained leadership of Moses. But that didn't happen because God is teaching us lessons, subtle lessons, as well as those things that are uh, plain in plain sight. So in chapter 20, let's start reading. I got, I've got to remember not to look at my Bible, but I use that as my God, guide. Chapter 20, and then the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, entered into the desert of Zin in the first month. So that would be equal to the same month that they were to uh, recognize and observe the uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, though that particular feast and observant they could do in the wilderness, the offerings, the vast majority of them, they could not do until they entered into the land uh, the prom that was promised to them. And that was that whole uh, area that is called the, the land of Israel. She died in the, that same month, which would be about uh, uh, March, April. And the people abode in Kadesh and Miriam died there and was buried there. So she was one of the ones who died in the wilderness as well. And there was no water for the congregation. And here they go again, and they gather themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and Aaron saying, uh, would God that we died when our brethren died before the Lord? Who in their right mind would say such a thing? Who would do that? Would to God that we had died when our brethren had died? Which ones? We have seen 
several rebellions of the redeemed, redeemed people. And look at what they are complaining and murmuring about still. And yet, has God abandoned them? No. But he is dealing with their sin and sinfulness. So why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? So they haven't put together that these different wildernesses that they're in are a direct result of their own disobedience and unbelief. And it's this wilderness, because if we go back up, and I hope that we'll be able to get through, and you'll be able to see some of this um, in Google Maps. When I was studying this, I began to chart uh, the different places that are identified here in Google Maps. And some of them I was able, successfully able to, to uh, locate them in Google Maps. Others, they're called by different names today. But it was interesting that now they're in this desert of Zin, but before that, they were in a different desert and they were in the desert of Paran. And these people could not make the connection between where they were and their lack of movement to their rebellions. Their sin, those that survived the different judgments blinded them to their decisions and choices to where they were. And it's amazing what these different locations reveal where these people were at these different times they were very difficult places to live in for any length of time. But it was brought on by their own disobedience and their own rebellions as we have seen. And it's good to observe and note that as they were judged, many thousands would die at any given time. And what they did not recognize and did not see how that was influencing the children that were coming up who would also be impacted and affected by, and some would even take on that same rebellious attitude. The long suffering of God is our salvation. And we see that plainly played out here. And how sin makes us say very stupid and unwise things. Would to God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Is it that bad? Are things that bad? No, they weren't. But their sin blinded them to the grace and the mercies of God. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there. And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. 
And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces and the glory of the Lord. Um, oops. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, take the rod and gather thou the assembly together. Now and Aaron and thy brother and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Notice that and speak you unto the rock before their eyes and it shall give forth his water and thou shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shall give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, hear now ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod, he smoked the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their beasts also. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of Israel, of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I gave them. Now that's big because Moses is compared to Christ Jesus in the book of, of uh, Hebrews in the New Testament. And Christ is compared to him in terms of Moses's faithfulness in all of his house. And he is highly regarded by the Lord God because on the Mount of, uh, figura of Transfiguration, it was Elijah and Moses who appear out of wherever God keeps those who are in him. He brought them forth so that the apostles who were there with uh, Christ Jesus, when he was, when some of his glory was revealed to them, here's Moses. So those arguments that some people bring against uh, saints that rebel or disobey the clear command of God as Moses did here and put them in hell, they are wrong. This is clearly wrong. Now, God has judged Moses because he told him to speak to the rock. Regardless of the frustration level by this time, and he had every right on a human level to be angry with these ungrateful people, God expected Moses to obey him. And what about us? How much more? Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I get, which I have given them. See, he said it unto Moses and to Aaron because Aaron should have stopped Moses because he called Aaron and Moses together and told them what, he, what to do. And Moses called them rebels. <laughs> I feel Moses right now because <laughs> I can just relate on just a, a being a parent and I know you can too. And the Lord is speaking to your conscience. Don't hit her. <laughs> Don't go there. And you do it anyway. I do it anyway. So I feel what Moses is feeling. I feel him. So it's like, while that is difficult, the Lord God expects us to obey his word. Aaron did not stop Moses. He had an opportunity after the first time 
after the first striking of the rock with the rod, he had a, the opportunity to do that then. He didn't. And so let's, yeah, thank you. He did not do that. And so because he didn't, it cost him. And what is it costing him? It's costing him his opportunity to enter in and the new uh, land that God has promised. So it costs, we pay for our disobedience, yes, but we don't lose out. And Moses did not lose out. He's not going to lose out. And so this is water of Meribah because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom, thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. How our fathers went down into Egypt and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee. He's asking his, the descendant now. He's asking, he's asking, uh, their brother, the descendant of Esau, the brother of Israel. Remember, Jacob and Esau were twins. Jacob is renamed Israel. And they had a conflict. And that conflict spilled over into the some of the uh, descendants of both families. And here we begin to see some family skirmishes that get go into the next generation. And then even if they are not impacted, we don't know that our descendants are gonna get along with one another. We don't know that our children as brothers and sisters are gonna get along with one another. We don't know that. We pray and hope that they are, they are able to resolve conflict because that's going to happen. Conflict is inevitable. It doesn't matter whether you are married, unmarried, uh, with your children, your cousin, your neighbor, conflict is going to happen. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, no, <laughs> you will not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. Wait a minute. We're cousins. The descendants of Israel and the descendants of Esau, who is Edom, Edom is Esau, according to the scripture, they are cousins. Why? Because Jacob and Esau are brothers. Their descendants are cousins. They knew who each other were. That's why Moses said, up here, go back. Moses said, thus saith thy brother. 
Israel. They knew who each other were. Moses was highly intelligent and he sent out spies. And so in reconnaissance missions, he thought that uh, the descendants of Israel's brother would respect that blood relationship. These people were not ignorant on either side. Edom also knew who uh, Israel was and the descendants. Conflict. So don't be discouraged if you are having difficulty with your family. What was the reason why the descendants of Edom not allow the passage of the children of Israel, their cousins, under the terms Moses proposed to him? or them, actually, because these were groups of city-states, and there may have been families that may have had uh, 10,000, maybe 25,000, maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000 here, various sizes and derelict. Uh, the sea people who are also uh, playing a part here, although I found that out only through uh, the historical, secular historical records, the relationships between these people and the politics of this age, um, very similar to what <laughs> and how we operate today politically and how we operate and live actually socially as nations um, and uh, cities, and states within nations. Very, very, very interesting and very, very similar. So he said, no. And if you try to do this, I'm gonna come, ag come against you with the sword. Now, these people have spent quite a bit of time in the wilderness, so they don't have time at this point to have weapons of warfare sufficient to engage in battle with large numbers and large groups of people. But Jesus put them in a position just for that to happen. Why? because the battle isn't theirs. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, did they trade with some of these groups of people who occupied that land before they destroyed and took over their land? Absolutely, they absolutely did. And there is a lot of secular historical data. I think the name of the book is called uh, 1777 BC, and it's the collapse of the Bronze Age, which is the, the this, they call it the Bronze Age. I, 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 I'm, I put this in the uh, early Bronze Age period, which differs than secular history because they reject the scripture. So they wanna put this actually in the Iron Age, which or the, it, at the earliest, the very late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age, but we can't do that because there's no archeological evidence to support that, which is the reason why they don't wanna move and change their time frame because they wanna discredit the Bible. But let every man be a liar and God's word be true. So what we have here, is they're getting ready to go into conflict, but they're not ready. 
and the Lord put them in a position and set them up so that they would know that the battle belongs to the Lord. And the children of Israel said unto him, we'll go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of the water, then I will pay for it. I will only without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, no. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him and you'll have family members to treat you like that. And as I was saying, don't be surprised and don't think it's strange that some of the battles and encounters that you have is with your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your uncle, your cousin, second cousin, fourth cousin, your neighbor, your employer, the girl at the grocery store. Don't be surprised by that. Conflict is inevitable. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. And the Lord spoke unto Moses in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people for he shall not enter into the land which I gave or have given unto the children of Israel because they rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Remember back in um, Exodus and Leviticus, we saw there was an incident with the water of Meribah. And these two incidents are, they seem to be similar, but there are some differences. And I'm of the persuasion that these are two separate incidents, lots of similarity, but they are different. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, and bring them up unto Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them up upon Eliezer, his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of the, all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, put them upon Eliezer, his son, and Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. And now I wanna go back and I wanna show you something here in trying to locate uh, these uh, places in Google Earth, and also to show you where some of the wilderness location spots. Okay, let's search. It's a little slow, but that's uh, not the computer. It's actually Google Earth. Okay, I did not want that. Let's go wilderness of Zen. 
That's where I want to take us first. It's going to take us to a place called Pai Haharoth, which was one of the locations that the children of Israel encamped. I want us to go to the wilderness of Zen because that's where we are in our study today and show you where the difficulty these people uh, had to live as a consequence of their disobedience. It was not a pleasant place and it didn't teach them a lesson. You would think that they would have learned, but they didn't. And remember what we read through our scriptures last week, that the scripture says that at, at a certain point, the Lord said, you know, these 10 times, these people have tempted and rebelled against me. And then he judged them. And we're going to see something similar here again. And hopefully you can see Google Earth populating. Um, and we're seeing an image for the wilderness of Zen, one of the location spots that I am able to get on Google Earth uh, that is recorded from the scriptural text that's still called by that name. And how they accepted these the hardship in this place and yet would complain about it and then attack Moses. And their attack on Moses was really their lashing out to God uh, regarding their unbelief and their predicament, but it was their own, it was of their own doing. Moses had nothing to do with their hardships that they themselves brought upon themselves as a result of their unbelief. So it would be in this area here, and let's see, as this continues to populate, if we could get a closer look at the region. So if you, this would be what you're looking at is an aerial view of that whole area um, and the outside of the wilderness of Zen. So I'm gonna see if I can zoom in. And I noticed though, as I zoom in, it kind of gets a little blur from Google Earth. So I'll try to get in as close as I can, just to give you some idea, if you can. Let's see if it gets clearer, the cameras get clearer as we wait a few minutes. But see this area and this region in Google Earth along this mountainous, notice there's no little to no green vegetation, trees, exposed. That's a 2D, which is up and down view. So here we are as we move around there, as it moves that region. And now I'm also going to go to okay, the next place, which is Mount Four. So it's going to populate. Okay. 
And this I found fascinating. I found it fascinating because Mount Hoare is a place that a group of people known as the Sabians And I'm gonna get closer in here. Yep, this is Mount the Mount Hoare, where they were. And, and look at this. Look at this, the elevation here. Um, let's see what Google Maps says. If we can, it usually gives you, gives you a lot of information. Um, the height, this is the place, this, right here and I'm gonna change and I'm gonna go to Mount Core from here because I want you to see this from a different angle. And I think I probably have to put up a new share on this one too, but that's okay. And you can see it coming on. Mount Hoare, and we're gonna zoom in on there. And there is a shrine on Mount Hor that still stands today. And we are going to get a little closer. And notice the tomb of Aaron the prophet popped up. That's because the people who there are people who live in the surrounding region and in these mountainous areas in that part of the world today. And they worship, literally worship Aaron. Uh, I believe they're called the Sabians. And they still worship Aaron. And there's a tomb very near Mount Hor that is directly, as you can see, pointing to where the tomb of the prophet Aaron is standing. And they're worshiping at that tomb today um, because they believe that uh, Aaron was actually even greater than um, Moses because of his priestly position. 
and they actually have a following um, today. There are lots of perversions of, of uh, on the Old Testament as well as New Testament um, biblical history and salvation message. And this is one of the many. So Aaron was worshiped and still is worshiped today by many of the people who live in these mountainous regions. And his tomb is, this is what his tomb looks like. Still in existence today, and he is worshiped today. And I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna see if we can go back to the image of the first one of Mount Hor. So this is a different view. It's the 3D view. This is where the children of Israel, look at this mountainous region. And they did not, Make the connection. Look at this. There's not, do you see anything green out there? It's just amazing that the people could not make that connection between where their choices and their decisions placed them. What were they doing? Why are we here? And then we complain, of course, there's no water in this area. And we can see where it's these mountains, these very same mountains that the Lord spoke unto Moses to hit the rock excuse me, to speak to the rock and where Moses hit the rock and they were given water in a place that's quite arid, very difficult terrain to live in. And as this moves, let's now get closer in and see if we can get a sharper view. I think it gets kind of dull here, but this is Mount Horeb. And then on this mountain and the direction, I believe it goes east across from that, the other mountainous people, the Sabaeans, uh, they worship Aaron and they erected that altar that we saw from the other Google map. Uh, Aaron's um, tomb, that's, that's what they call it. And they worship Aaron, the priest. And now we go into chapter 21. And I wanna comment just before we go there um, that we saw, remember the Edom, the people and the king of Edom, the Edomites refused them passage. Um, and came out against them. And now another group, Arid, the Canaanite, king of, of a group of the Canaanites, he dwelt in the south and he heard that Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoner. And so that opens up chapter 21 
and also these fiery serpents. And we're gonna see why that is the case. Because at some point, a thank you, I appreciate you, should have come forth for the amazing things God did while they were in this very rough wilderness. The wilderness is a rough experience. As you and I live in this world, it is a pattern. It's like a wilderness. It's difficult. It is problems from ranging from your health, living, food, people, um, unseen, supernatural influences, because we're wrestling against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies is very difficult. And those without Christ, I know they're catching hell, regardless of the smile, regardless of the makeup, the airbrush, regardless of all of that, regardless of the, the, the jewelry, all this world's riches, you and I are in the same earth and we are exposed to the same um, uh, effects of spiritual uh, influences, demonic and otherwise, and we are all in the same curse. This earth is, is cursed from the curse of sin. So I know you catch in hell. I know you are. How, uh, how are you making it? You're not. And that accounts for the vices, the various addictions, finding ways to cope and looking for ways to cope living in a sin-cursed world and outside of Christ, if the saints are catching it, and we do, we're not exempt. The same rains, the, the, you know, the, the floods down in, in, in Tennessee and, and um, the high winds brought on by the recent hurricanes and the loss of life and the drowning of those two precious little babies, twins, you know, that those, the parents of those children, my God, we don't know whether these people were saved or unsaved. But despite that, there were saved folks who lost their homes, just like the unsaved. There are saved who lost their family members just like the unsaved. There are saved who uh, develop cancer in their body, just like the unsaved. Diabetes. We are not exempt. But how we cope and deal with our wilderness experience. Will it be a pattern like the children of Israel? Where many were overthrown in the wilderness. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel as a nation and delivered up the Canaanite and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of that place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor, which is the mountainous region that we just saw in Google Maps by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom 
and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I would be too. We're going to go back into that imagery because look at the terrain of this place. Red, C, and then look at the distance. But this all came as a consequence of their disobedience. Now here's the Red Sea region. Now, Mount Horeb, where they were, was back in this region over here. And as we get a closer look at this area, okay, this is much better. It's back here in this area where they were. And this is giving you a roundabout view of the Red Sea area region, but Canaan is gonna be up in this area up here. They caught a difficult, they made a, a 40 day journey they made it difficult by their unbelief. It wasn't Moses. And so that's where they were. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Now, because Aaron's gone, wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now look at what their claim is. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. You know that manna, that bread that came from heaven? That generation that were not destroyed in any of the previous judgments including this one that's coming with the fiery serpents. Loathe that manna. Angel's food, the scripture says, manna is. Their soul loathe that, wanting to go back into Egypt. Keep in context now, this is a redeemed people. No other people had, had a manifestation of the creator of the universe like these people in this time did. The children of Israel and the mixed multitude that were delivered out of Egypt. No one since have seen the power of God as they saw it and yet desired Egypt. It won't be in its fullness until the time of the Gentile be fulfilled that the manifestation and the power and the supernatural power of God is gonna be revealed like it was in this time in salvation history and in secular history.
And the people spoke against God and Moses, wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, no water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people and much of Israel died. Much of the people of Israel died. All of those numbers from the census that was taken early on in the book of Numbers, we're going to see the differences, which I've, I've done the work to do that. Who's going to enter in? Remember, none of the original adults above age 20 who weren't killed in those other judgments, they're not coming in, they're gone. It's their children now. And those who are not uh, living by faith, trusting in the word of God, they're not coming in either. All of them, are being overthrown in the wilderness. And one of the questions that I have, and I'm uh, doing some communications and some studies with uh, some of the archeologists uh, and scientists. There are scientists who are Christian, who are, they're just doing some incredible work in the Lord uh, about the discovery. Have they discovered any of the uh, remains, skeletal remains of humans in the areas that are revealed to us in the scriptures. And there are some answers to that question because that's one of the questions that I have with respect to the evidence for all of these death that has occurred in the wilderness for their disobedience. And so fiery serpents, the Lord sent the fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, but we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Now pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make you a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Some of the people still did not believe in the Lord. The condition for being healed from this judgment that came from the Lord was that they who were bitten look upon the brass serpent that God commanded Moses to make and set up on a pole that if they looked upon it, they would be healed. Do you know that there are people who didn't do that? When the Lord judges and he does judge our sin, he laid out the remedy for being healed. And let's go into 1 John. We're going to see what that is. I have said it. And it's in found in First John, 
I think. Let's go in here and do a time check real quick. And let's go into It's chapter two. If we go into first John chapter one, if we confess our sins, well, let me just back up a little bit. If in verse eight, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I warn us today, we hear a lot about science will give us the answer. What's the science on this? And science has its place. Believers don't uh, reject science. That's lunacy. That's, and anybody who says that about Christians, you can dismiss them as being a very, you can dismiss them as being very ignorant. They are the ignorant ones because believers don't reject truth. You don't, and you can't know knowledge apart from the truth. And there are learned men and women who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that he have given us throughout all times. But to attempt to live in a culture and a society apart from Christ denies sin. So the scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we all have sinned and we all sin, past tense, present tense. So we do sin, however saints. And those of you who feel dirty and unclean, the reason why is because you are in your sins. And that's what sin make you feel like, dirty, unclean, and no matter how many baths you take or how many programs you get involved with or how many times you go to the therapist, you still feel dirty because your issue is a spiritual one. It's the condition of our soul. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You want to feel clean? I want to feel clean? Start confessing. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember that red heifer or that red cow? See, now Eliezer and three others would have to get a, a cow in addition to that serpent, brass serpent, to cleanse the, the community again. We don't have to do that. Christ is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that way we remain separated or sanctified and, and we can never lose our place in Christ. We can't, it's impossible. If you do it God's way, it's impossible. 
It's only those who Jesus is saying to, I never knew you because they were never saved. Are you saying once saved, always saved? I qualify that by the scripture. If we follow the scripture, yes. What kind of salvation is it whereby you can have it today, lose it 20 minutes from now, get it back 45 minutes from now, then lose it 18 hours later, then gain it back 72 hours later. That's crazy. That's not salvation. Remember the fine flour that's talked about in the meal offering, the righteousness. Righteousness is consistent. Christ is consistency. So you can't lose your place in Christ. Your soul has been redeemed. And you, no man can take you out of Christ's hands. Not even you. You can't even get out. <laughs> so that's good news. So that's how we maintain our purity, not by offering a red cow or as our new, uh, our English version and our new King James is read the red heifer. No, it's through Christ. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So confess our sins, something that they did not do. And there are those who won't do that because they believe that they're not sinners. They're not saved according to the scriptures. May God bless you. May God um, keep you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his grace and his peace to rest upon you and keep you in peace all week long. Do it God's way, saints. Do it God's way. And guess what? You can rest in him. You don't have to worry about whether you're saved, whether you gave enough, whether you do enough. Don't have to worry about that. If that's the case, then our senior citizens are gone. They're lost. Because many of us, as we age, we don't, and we cannot do what we used to do. So it can't be that. It can't be that. It must be by God's grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. God bless you in Jesus alone. Amen.